everyone recoup from Christmas? Christmas decorations down, everything's put away, right? If through Christmas time, it's, it's a whole different schedule, at least at church. And it drives me crazy because <laughs> I'm a structure kind of guy. And I like it when there's, you know, when there's no church on Wednesday and there's no Sunday school, it just throws everything off for me. And then the kids are off school, so it's just, I'm glad it's back to normal. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> We are back studying our life of David. Now, I'm going to ask you a question, both as children who are now adults and as adults. When you were growing up, did your parents do things and restrict things that you thought were mean and unfair and things that they wouldn't let you do or things they told you to do that you really didn't like at that point? But now as an adult, all of a sudden your parents were smart, right? How many of you find that to be true? And all all the, what's that? Yeah. Well, they're they're still on the dark side of the moon. Dobson says, like from 17 to 25, if you remember the Apollo missions, when they went on the back side of the moon, there was no communication with Earth. And Dobson says, that's the dark side of the moon, that's, with teenagers, that's the dark side, but there's no communication. But when they come around the other side, 25 or so, there's now communication. And it's amazing how smart you parents got in that two or three years that there was no communication. The reason we parents do that is because hopefully we know better. And we want to protect our kids from hardship, consequences, We want to protect them from maybe things that we did that we don't want them to do. Well, the one thing about the Bible is it doesn't sugarcoat anything. It tells you exactly how it is, and it tells you why it is. And we're kind of kind of look at that today. Last time we got together, we talked about David's sin with Bathsheba. And when Nathan confronted him and he told him what all the consequences of that was going to be. And now we're going to look at those consequences today. Because as the Bible says, there is no consequence-free sin. There's always going to be a consequence to the things that we do in violation of God's law. Whether it's big or small, there's always going to be repercussions. And God wants us to see through David's life who David man after God's own heart, but yet consequences to his actions. Chapter 13, we begin to see those consequences. And just like as parents, we try to protect our kids from hurting themselves or doing any kind of damage, we want to protect them. And so we restrict their actions because we know what's best. We know what will happen if they do it or what will happen if they don't. And God wants to show us through David's sin the devastation that sin can cause in your life if you allow it to happen. God knows what will happen to us when we sin, so he warns us to keep away from it. Just like children think you as parents are denying them enjoyment and fun and pleasure, you're in reality protecting them from themselves or from what's out in the world. God says the same thing. Dobson says more is caught than taught. You know what that means? That means your kids are going to be who you are, not what you tell them to be. What they see in you is what they're going to do, for good or bad. So we're now at 2 Samuel 13, 1, and says, In the course of time, Amnon, son of David, fell in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, son of David. So as you read this paragraph, this is kind of like a, a soap opera come to life, a lifetime movie of the week. So let's look at the players here. Amnon is David's firstborn. He's the heir to the throne. He's the firstborn child of David. Tamar is Amnon's half-sister on David's side. Absalom is David's third-born son, Tamar's full brother, Amnon's half-brother. Jonadab is all of their cousins. Okay, you got it? Got the players? Days of our lives got nothing on this family. So Amnon now is in love with his half-sister. 
Now, we understand that the Bible forbids that already. In Leviticus 18.9, it says, Do not have sexual relations with your sister, either your father's daughter or your mother's daughter, whether she was born in the same home or elsewhere. So that precludes half-siblings. But since David had a lady he wasn't allowed to have, why not Amnon? My dad got away with it. He did it. Why not me? He didn't seem to die. David's life seemed to be going on okay. So that law must not apply to me, Amnon's thinking. So verse 2 says, Amnon becomes frustrated to the point of illness on account of his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin, and it seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. One thing to have thoughts about something, the enemy will always put thoughts and temptations in your mind. It's what do you do with the thought that comes in your mind. The Bible says take every thought captive, right? And dismiss it. The enemy, when Jesus was in the garden, God put, or the enemy put thoughts in his mind about what to do. And every time Jesus rebe- we came back at him with scripture, he took that thought captive to the glory of Christ and he got rid of the thought. Amnon had the thought, but he let that thought consume him. It's one thing to think about it. It's another to start thinking about it and planning it and looking at all the consequences that can happen. How do you get it done? That's exactly what he's doing. Matthew 5.27 says, You have heard it said that do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And as we said, 2 Corinthians 10.5, we take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. So when these thoughts come in, Amnon should have dismissed it right away and said, what does God's law say? Regardless of what my dad did, God's law says this, but he didn't. He followed what he saw his dad do. He knew God's law. I'm sure as David's son, he knew the law. But instead of doing what he was told, he did what he saw. So verse 3 in 2 Samuel 13 says, Now Amnon had a friend, or a cousin, named Jonadab, son of Shimea, David's brother. Jonadab was a very shrewd man. He asked Amnon, Why do you, the king's son, look so haggard morning after morning? Won't you tell me, Amnon said to him, I'm in love with Tamar, my brother's Absalom's sister. Now, He's the king's son. He's probably got everything he could want. Probably hasn't worked a day in his life. Sits around, poor, poor me. (laughs) I can't have her. I can have everything else. I'm the king's son. I could probably have any other woman I wanted. But just like his dad, he goes after the one he can't have. He stays in bed all day, walks around in his robe, probably hasn't taken a shower in a couple of days. Looks like death warmed over, all because he can't have his half-sister. Poor guy. Feel bad for him. See the similarities? Just like David could have had any woman he wanted, and God basically said that to him, he picked the one he couldn't. Sound like Adam and Eve? You can have any tree, anything you want in this garden except one. What do you want? You want the one that you can't have. Why do we always want the thing we can't have? There's always something that God says we can't have, and that's always the thing we're gravitating to. Why? Because just like the Old Testament, God used the law to show the people that they couldn't obey it. When God says you can have any tree in the garden, anything except one, it makes you think about the one. Sin always makes us think about the what we can have and we ignore everything that God has blessed us with. Are you satisfied with what God has given us? Or do you always want the one thing that you may not be able to have? So Amnon hangs out with the wrong guy. His cousin, probably another spoiled rich kid with nothing to do. They have that entitled mentality. I'm entitled to it. 
I'm the king's son, I'm the king's cousin. I'm entitled to this. And none tells him he loves his half-sister. Both of those guys knew the law. They knew they weren't allowed to do it. And yet they planned to do it anyways. And now Jonadab tells him what to do. Verse 5 says, Go to bed and pretend to be ill. When your father comes to see you, say to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and give me something to eat. Let her prepare the food in my sight so I may watch her and then eat it from her hand. Be careful who you hang out with. And be careful the advice you get from people. And that goes as far as be careful what you read. Be careful what you watch. Be careful what you listen to. Because not everything out there, and even in Christian circles, is beneficial. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. When given the choice, without any fear of consequence, we tend to choose the wrong thing. And those you hang around with, you become. Another pattern here. David lied to Uriah about coming home from the war. Now Amnon's about to lie to David about why he wants his sister. You're beginning to see the destructive pattern of a bad example. Proverbs 25, 26 says, if the godly compromise with the wicked, it's like polluting a fountain or muddying a spring. I saw a clip the other day about compromise with the world. And uh, from those guys, we watch the skit, the skit guys, we watch those clips every once in a while. And the thing he, uh, they were doing a little play, a little parody, the two of them. And one is playing the son, one's playing the dad. And the son says, hey, can I go and, and do this? And the dad says, no, I don't think you should do that. Well, but dad, everybody's doing it. He says, doesn't that, you know, doesn't that movie involve some swearing? Well, just a little bit, dad. Well, doesn't that movie involve some nudity? Well, just a little bit, dad. He says, oh, okay, all right, you can go. Before you go, let me give you some of your favorite brownies. So the kid's chomping on the brownies. He says, you like those brownies, do you? He says, oh, yeah, Dad, they're awesome. They're great. He says, you know what? I put in those brownies, right? The kid says, well, you put chocolate. Yeah, put chocolate. And I put all the necessary ingredients, but I also put a little bit, just a little bit, Dad, or son, of dog poop in that brownie. And then, you know, the kid's face got all crazy. The point was, obviously, just a little bit of friendship with the world and acquiescing to a little bit of sin is just like the same thing. Well, it's just a little bit in the brownie, but it ruins everything. It changes your whole attitude toward it when you say it's just a little bit. David was compromising a little bit, polluting a fountain or muddying a spring. I'll use you as an example. Those of you who don't know, they had a little problem with a little bit of E. coli in their water. Keith and Lynette did a couple of months back. Can't see it. Can't smell it. It's just a little bit. But that little bit of E. coli has wreaked havoc in your life since then. Has it not? Just a little bit. What's the Bible say? If the godly compromise with the wicked, it's like polluting a fountain. The fountain was polluted. David's family had compromised with the wicked. Now the whole thing was becoming polluted. One person was bringing about that bad example. 2 Samuel 13, 6. So Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill. When the king came to see him, Amnon said to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and make some special bread in my sight so that I might eat from her hand. Now, if you remember, the Bible referred to David as having a lot of wisdom. 2 Samuel 14, 20 says, but you are as wise as an angel of God, I'm talking about David, and you understand everything that happens among us. So someone had mentioned to him that, David, you're a pretty smart guy. 
You're pretty wise in the ways of the world. But now he's in a position he's not so wise anymore. He's not really listening to the Spirit of God that may be talking to him at that point. He doesn't see anything wrong. The wisdom that he had is kind of going away. He sends Tamar to his place. Where's that wisdom and understanding of everything that happens around? Compromise, so it's gone. So verse 7 says, David sent word to Tamar at the palace, go to the house of your brother Amnon and prepare some food for him. Where's the wisdom? Where's that check in your spirit? When you begin to compromise, you tend to ignore those little checks in your spirit. Or you don't even hear them anymore because you're so worried about what you're doing and the sin you've done. Doesn't he hear? Doesn't he kind of see or sense anything going on here? Why would Amnon want his sister to feed him? David, who you once deceived Uriah, was now being deceived by Amnon. And David was allowing his daughter to come to that place. He was allowing his daughter to be raped because he wasn't smart. He wasn't listening. He was so wrapped up in covering up his sin and living for himself that he forgot about the wisdom of God. So verse 8 says, So Tamar went to the house of her brother Amnon who was lying down. She took some dough, kneaded it, made the bread in his sight, and baked it. Then she took the pan and served him the bread, but he refused to eat. She's doing everything right. She's being the dutiful daughter. She's preparing him lunch. She obeys her dad, the king, taking care of her older brother, doing everything right. Sin always affects other people. And a lot of times it affects the innocent people in the process. Verse 9 says, send everyone out of here, Amnon said. So everyone left him. Then Amnon said to Tamar, bring the food here to my bedroom so I might eat from your hand. You know, I've never been that sick that I've had to actually have someone feed me from their hand. So I'm thinking Tamar might be questioning a little bit. But she says, then Tamar took the bread she had prepared and brought it to her brother Amnon in his bedroom. She's doing everything right. She's the good child. And what does she get for her efforts, for being the dutiful daughter? She gets attacked. Let's look at Uriah. Uriah was a good guy. He was doing everything right. He was obeying the king. He fought for David. He stayed twice outside his house instead of going in because it was the right thing to do. Then he went back to join the fight. He did everything right. Notice a pattern here. What's Uriah get for his efforts and for doing everything right? Gets killed. Don't think for a minute that Amnon didn't take this lesson from his father. And again, we see that sin always hurts other people sometimes more than it hurts us who commit it. He was about to ruin his sister because he's so selfish. Because his father was so selfish. Verse 11 says, But when she took it to him to eat, he grabbed her and said, Come to bed with me, my sister. Amnon's lust and sinful thoughts were so overwhelming in his mind that he forgot everything else. And he was about to consummate the act that he had been planning and preparing for who knows how long. If you think you can sit around and contemplate sin and think about it and plan it and not have it affect you, you're wrong. Because it will always overtake the power of the Holy Spirit because you are suppressing that power when you concentrate and think about and plan out what this sin is going to be. Whether it's a small one or a big one, the Bible says sin is sin. When you contemplate it and you think about it, it's always going to lead you to where you don't want to go. So she starts to resist him. She first tries to appeal to a sense of doing what God wants. 
Verse 12 says, don't, my brother, she said to him, don't force me. Such a thing should not be done in Israel. Don't do this wicked thing. The first thing we should always ask ourselves when a thought comes in, is this what God wants? Is this what God would have me to do? Doesn't matter what everybody else is doing. What does God say about this? Notice, Amnon had gotten to the point where it didn't matter what God said because he knew it. And she reminded him of it. And yet he was so entrenched in doing what he wanted to do that he ignored what God wanted. If you get to the point where you're constantly focusing on doing something you know you shouldn't do, you are going to ignore what you know God's word to be. You're going to continue on the path you're on because you don't want to hear the truth. We all know people that, who head down the wrong path and no matter how you try to appeal to them about what God's word says, they still ignore you. Or they come up with lame excuses to justify it. God knows my heart. I said this to the youth today. So you know, God's word never says he wants you to be happy. You know that? God, said, God never said, I want you to be happy. Because that's the reason for most people's sin. I want to be happy. I, this will make me happy. Well, God's not in the process or in the job of making us happy. He can give us joy in a situation, but he's not out to make you happy. That's not his goal. And as parents, we're not out to make our kids happy, Right? And as they get older, the less happy we make them. When people get to the point where they're focused on doing something, they don't want to hear what God's word says. And they will reject it or give you some other scripture to twist what they want to do. So God's word doesn't work on him. So then she tries to appeal to his emotions and his feelings towards her. And verse 13 says, what about me? Where can I get rid of my disgrace? If you're not gonna think about God, then how about thinking about me? What are you, what, what's gonna happen to me when this is done? Don't you care enough about me not to do this? I'm your sister. Don't you have any conscience, man? Again, we said before that sin is very selfish. It's all about me, myself, and I. What do I want? I don't care about your feelings. I don't care about you or what happens to you. All I care about is me. Now, we have that example already in the Bible from King Hezekiah. Now, you remember King Hezekiah was a good king for most of his life. God gave him 15 years. We've talked about that before. But then we come to verse 16 in chapter 20 of 2 Kings. And after now, he had sinned by showing his enemy all his wealth and everything he had, and God was not happy with that. And so he sent Isaiah to Hezekiah to kind of tell him what his consequences were going to be. And it says, then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, listen to this message from the Lord. The time is coming when everything you have, all the treasures stored up by your ancestors will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. Some of your own descendants will be taken away into exile. They will become eunuchs who will serve in the palace of the Babylon's king. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the message you have given me from the Lord is good. But the king was thinking, at least there will be peace and security in my lifetime. Who cares about what happens after I'm gone? As long as I get what I want and my life ends in peace, I don't care about anybody else. I don't care about my kids. I don't care about my grandkids. I don't care about anybody else as long as my life is good. That was what Hezekiah was thinking. And that's exactly what David was thinking with Uriah and Amnon's thinking with Tamar. I mean, David sent his his friend out to be killed because it's all about me. Well, that didn't work. So then she appeals to his sense of self-preservation. If you're not going to think about what God cares about, and if you don't care what I think, what about yourself? Verse 13 says, and what about you? You will be like one of the wicked fools in Israel. Don't you care about yourself? 
Don't you care about the consequences that are going to happen to you? Because sin, you never think you're going to get busted for sin. It always happens to somebody else. They'll suffer the consequences, but I'm going to do it in a way that I'm not going to get the consequences. It's not going to happen to me. I'll get away with it because no one's going to care. No one's going to know. What's the Bible say? Be sure your sin will find you out. So he won't listen to God. He won't listen to his sister. He won't even care about himself because he doesn't think he's going to get caught. And then she tries to trick him out of it. Verse 13 says, please speak to the king. He will not keep me from being married to you. Now what she was trying to do was just to hold him off. She knew the king would say, no, you can't do that. It's against God's law. So she was just trying to basically trick him to let her go for the time. She knew that what the law said. She knew they couldn't get married because the law prohibited it. She was trying to just get out of his grip at that moment. But none of those things stopped Amnon from getting what he wanted. Verse 14, just like David, nothing that happened prevented him from getting what he wanted. Verse 14 says, he refused to listen to her, and since he was stronger than she, he raped her. And so for us to know that Amnon didn't really love her, he only lusted for her, what happens? His attitude changed instantly. Verse 15, that Amnon hated her with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had loved her. Amnon said to her, get up and get out. You think sin is going to fulfill you at that moment. You think what you can't have is going to give you what you want. And man, if I just had this one thing that God says I can't have, I'll be happy. Never works out that way. You never, sin never gives you what it promises you. It only gives you heartache. What's the Bible say in John 10.10? 10? The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Every time we're tempted to sin, that is the devil's intended consequence. To steal from you, to kill you, and destroy you. I used to think kill and destroy were the same thing. But God can just, or you can be destroyed without being killed. I think David's family was destroyed. He wasn't killed, but his family was destroyed. And as always, the sinner isn't the only one who suffers, but everyone the sin touches is affected by it. David sinned. It affected Uriah and Amnon, and later we're going to see how it affects Absalom. Amnon sinned. It affected Tamar, and eventually it did catch up to him, and he was killed. You know, we, we mentioned that less has cancer sin is a cancer sin isn't something you try to live with sin isn't something you try to work out and go along with cancer is something you want to totally eradicate from your life and most often cancer is involved and you want to cut it out and get rid of it and a lot of times those surgeries involve removing parts of your body it's so bad that you got to cut part of your body out to get rid of the cancer you don't let it sit there and let it do what it wants to do you have to get rid of it right now and right this moment and if that doesn't work you poison your body enough to get rid of the cancer because that is how bad cancer is sin is cancer you can't live with it you have to get rid of it right now you can't play with it. You can't try to work with it. It will eventually kill you. The Bible says if you continue, Romans 8, if you continue in flagrant sin, you will die. And he's talking to believers here. If you continue in flagrant sin, you'll die. And he's talking spiritual death. You'll come to the point where you're, you're so involved in doing things you know you shouldn't do, you're going to quit listening to what God says. You're going to quit 
reading, obviously. You can't read your Bible because, you know, the Bible says you shouldn't be doing it. Then you're going to quit praying because whenever you pray, you feel that guilty conscience, the Spirit speaking to you, saying, talking to you about that situation. And so you're going to quit praying. And then you're going to quit coming to church because when you walk in church, you feel guilty. And what happens at that point? You, you walk away from God. And you now have rejected everything that God's given you. And you spiritually die. Difference between cancer and sin. Cancer kills only you. Sin will kill you and everyone around you. We're in 2018 now. Brand new year. We all make resolutions, or some of us make resolutions. How about we make it the year that we let God continue to get rid of the sin in our lives? We've been watching the same video up with the kids that we watched on Wednesday night about holiness and uh, being friends with the world. The thing is, you can't be friends with the world and friends with God. You've got to pick one. The Bible says if you're friends with the world, you're at enmity with God. In other words, you're in opposition to what God wants. Sin will never be totally eradicated as long as we're here physically. But we can make a choice and let the Holy Spirit continue to prompt us to live the way we know to live. And that means taking every thought captive, having the mind of Christ in every situation, and when temptation comes our way, knowing enough of God's word to be able to rebuke the temptation that's in your mind. If you don't know God's word and temptation comes and you don't know what God says about that temptation, you have no weapons to fight. That's why the Bible is called the sword of the spirit. It's the only offensive weapon in the armor of God because you have to whack at the enemy with God's word to defeat him. You can't always play defense. You have to go on the offense on occasion when temptation comes your way. We want 2018 to be the year that we live our lives that honors God in every situation. Not because we're afraid of the consequences, but because we know that God has our best interests at heart and there's a reason that God says, do this, don't do that. Amen? Would you stand as we close this morning? Just in time, Mark. Every head bowed, every eye closed, if you would. Most everyone here has been a, a part of our church for some time now. But I would be remiss in offering the opportunity to allow someone here who may need Jesus in their life. Maybe you've been a part of this church, you've been here for many, many weeks or just a few weeks, but you've never really accepted Christ for the forgiveness of your sins to allow you to have a right relationship with God. You know about Jesus and you've been in church and you've, you've heard it all, you know all the stories, but you've never come to the point where you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. If that's you and you want to do that this morning, the Holy Spirit is prompting you, he's speaking to you, and you feel that nag in your, in your, in your spirit that this is for me that you want to get right with God, you know you're not right, but you want to get right. This is the opportunity to do that. The Bible says he stands at the doorway of your heart and he knocks, but you have to open the door. If that's you and you want to do that this morning, you want to accept Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, to make you right with God, to make you a part of God's family, I want you to raise your hand right now.
All right, for the rest of us who I believe are committed followers of Christ, none of us lives a, a holy, righteous, and perfect life. And that is why we go to Christ every day, take time to pray, confess our sins, move on. The Bible says in 1 John, if you are faithful, if you can confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of those sins, cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Every time, we, we sin all the time. We can't help it, that's who we are. We can alleviate it, we can sin less. But the difference is when we know we've done it, we want to repent, which means turn around the other way and do just the opposite. Confess it. Tell God you did it. God already knows you did it. And turn around and don't do it again. Jesus said to the woman, go and sin no more. You've been forgiven. Now stop doing it. We as Christians have to acknowledge the fact that when we sin, we need to ask God for forgiveness and then move on from that point. And the more we become like Christ, the less we will have flagrant sin. And the more we'll have the Holy Spirit putting a check in our spirit about things we should or shouldn't do. Not because we're afraid of what God will smack us with, but because we know that God's plan is perfect for us. And God is trying to protect us from all the negative consequences that will come. David was forgiven. David was forgiven of his sin. He was righteous in God's eyes. However, the consequences of those things lingered on. God knows the consequences of the things we may or may not do. So Father, we want to do the right thing to avoid all the negative consequences. Help each person here, Lord, I pray to be sensitive to the move of the Spirit, to be sensitive to what your Word says, to take time to study your Word so that our lives will be a reflection of who Jesus is and means to us. Father, we love you this morning. We're so grateful that you took all of our sins on the cross. You paid the debt we should have paid. All the judgment from God was upon Jesus on that day for all of our sins, past, present, and future. And for that, Father, we are eternally grateful. And all we want to do now is just live our lives in gratitude of that fact. Bless each person this morning, Lord. Allow the Holy Spirit to minister to them, to meet their needs. Let life change and transformation take place in each person's life every day. We serve a God who is a continuing God of miracles, a God of answered prayer, a God of supernatural manifestations. All that didn't change when the book of Acts was done. But it continues on today. So we we are expecting you to be active in our lives in a tangible way. And Father, I commit each person to you to do that in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. amen. Have a great week. We will see you next week, business meeting, following the service next week, and Wednesday. Don't forget to come out Wednesday.